Hello and welcome to the Just Interesting Podcast, the podcast where nothing is fascinating, everything is better than boring, because it's just interesting. <laughs> I, oh, that almost worked. Uh, <laughs> with me, Robin, today, are Martin. Hello, Martin. Hello, Robin. How are you? How are you doing? You look like you're in the jungle. I am in the jungle. Because the if anyone, for anyone listening to this instead of watching, <laughs> Robin's got a uh, what I what I imagine is a bit of a sound booth up there, but it has a jungle vibe to it in the background. It does. It's really nice. A little bit of green fabric in there, leafy kind of design on it. Yeah, wonderful. Some wonderful. Ab- absorbent panels on the wall and some absorbent panels on the floor. Yeah, freestanding. Um, and Alex, uh, how are you? I'm good as well. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, no, I'm I'm very jealous of your backdrop. I've, Thank you. As you can see, for those of you seeing rather than listening, <laughs> I have I have nothing behind me. Absolutely nothing. I've got nothing. Avoid you're you're in a you're in a Vedansk cell. <laughs> Just infinite beige all around. Although me. you do have some nice gaming lights that you use on our Twitch streams, which is very very good. Kind of. I, they're not nice. I've got one tiny pathetic light that doesn't even light up the room. It's it's terrible. Um, but no, there's no there's no follow up to that. It's, <laughs> there's it's no but. <laughs> it's just but terrible. Maybe one day, one day I can improve that. But I'm still waiting for suggestions what I can put behind me because I need to I need to do some decorating in here. I think life size cardboard cutouts of me and Robin. That'd be nice. Yeah, that'd be nice. We'll send you photos. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. put your suggestions in the comments below if you're watching us on YouTube <laughs> uh, or on the podcast platform of your choice. Please give us feedback. If you can't leave a review, uh, whether it's because it's not iTunes or whatever it is. Um, then on oh, no, the iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts. Sorry. Um, please uh, check out our Twitter and give us your thoughts on Twitter. J interesting YT. Thank you very much. Exactly. Uh, today we'll be discussing something inspired by recent events and hopefully to put a positive spin on recent events, which is to do with people who are worshipped as gods. Oh, Robot Robin number one. Oh, he's not a person. <laughs> oh no, I'm not. Oh wait, not wait. What? Robots are people too, and I'm not a robot. Let's let's just clear the air now. Um, but yeah, that, that'll be the topic of discussion. But of course, before all that, we'll be uh, revealing the things that we learned this week, and afterwards, we'll be having a quiz, which I wrote for Alex and Martin to go head to head because the league table is is getting it's getting tight, man. It's getting getting tight, man. It's, it's okay, very close. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I mean, I we're nearing the... the end of the season three now, so it'll soon yeah. be time to announce the winner of the trophy. I think from Indeed. the quiz today, it will either be I take the lead or Martin makes it level, so we're all drawing. Yeah, so if, Ma- if Martin makes it level, level, neck and neck. Wow. Competition. Wow. Deep breaths, deep breaths. Martin's currently the trophy holder, so, Martin, I'm so Martin's trophy, interest Martin. to tie again, so he can keep the trophy. <laughs> thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, gentlemen, without any further ado, what did you learn this week, Alex? Well, I learned... Uh, Something very interesting this week. Have either of you heard of the man who never was? <laughs> it sounds like a terrible, terrible, terrible eighties <laughs> film. You're wrong, Martin. It was a fifties film. <laughs> um, a nineteen fifty six Cannes Film Festival. Film, oh, it was a actually. film. Yeah, it was the man who never was. <laughs> yeah. You are absolutely right. But it's based on a on a real story. Ooh. On Operation Mincemeat. Have you ever heard of this? No. Sorry, I'm almost just spat out my coffee. No, Operation Mince Me. What, what a name. Okay, let me let me let me give you the let me give you the rundown. So nine, the year is 1943. Uh, it's the height of the war. Germany is is on the offensive in the Soviet Union, and uh, well, I mean, at, at this point, the 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 tides are starting to turn in favor of the Allies. Starting mm. to anyway, mm. and. In Spain, on a, on a beach one day, a Spanish fisherman finds a body of a British Royal Marine soldier. Hmm. And the ID on this, this man reads Major William Martin. There's just one problem, though. This major never existed. He, was a, he never, never existed. And in finding, ah. in finding this body, the fisherman actually set into motion a long planned out ruse by the British Secret Service to fool Adolf Hitler into making a glaring tactical blunder. The man who never Roll the credits. (laughs) 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 So um, basically, 
This was a plan devised in a document that was actually thought to be written up by none other than Ian Fleming. Yeah. No way, creator of James Bond and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. So at this point in the war, the Allies had just had huge success in the North African campaign. Uh, and they were looking at where they could invade next from here. And they basically had two <laughs> options. They had, they had two obvious options. They had Sicily, mm. which would be a big um, tactical advantage, give the Allies a tactical advantage in Italy um, and push through, to, yep. push through to Europe that way. Um, or Greece. Um, was another another option that they could go for, and then they would be able to they move north and push funnel the Nazis into a kind of pincer motion into the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. Um, so there were two different options, but the the option the Allies decided to go for was Sicily. However, Sicily was a very obvious target. It was very obvious that the Nazis like would would notice that they were going to attack. The Allies would, would attack Sicily. It was, it was right in front of them. It was obvious that it was going to be Sicily. So what did they do? They devised a plan to get a corpse of someone. And they found a, a homeless, a Welsh homeless vagrant who had just killed himself in King's Cross St. Pancras. And they dressed him up to make him look like a major William Martin, who just so happened... To be holding some uh, some important documents, mm-hmm. uh-huh. some important top secret classified yes. documents, and they chose Spain to drop off this this body uh, because Spain was known at the time to be rife with with Nazi spies and intelligence, um, and it was very clever because what they did is they actually hid an eyelash in one of the documents. And they and so the official policy with Spain is that any time they found like British secret documents, they would return them to London straight away. Right. And that's what the Spanish did. But they were able to tell that they had let people look through the documents first because they noticed that this yeah. eyelash, which was like placed very specifically in in amongst the pages, right, yeah. uh, was no longer there. So they had known that someone had looked through these documents and seen them. I'm not going to lie, mate. An eyelash can move quite easily, can't it? <laughs> I was thinking Especially that. I might, they must have they 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 submerged from, from, in water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They must but have vacuum sealed these documents. I mean, it's, a, it's an old yeah. trick. You see it in a lot of spy movies where they, they pluck a hair from their head and they'll put it against the door frame mm-hmm. across the crack in the door so that they know if somebody's been in the room because they'll have opened the door. Um, but yeah, I feel like papers f- being removed from a dead body and being put in transit from Spain to Britain, chance of the eyelash moving seem a bit bit high but it's a good idea and it clearly worked well i mean it, it did it did work because of this because of operation mincemeat adolf hitler was was convinced that he'd got one over on the not uh, got one over on the allies <laughs> ah, those had... nazis i have some on the island <laughs> Fuhrer, we and are the nazis what he he was convinced that he'd got an insight into their plans and uh was convinced that they were going to attack Greece instead. Sorry, I should have said that's what they put in the documents. Yes, their yeah, plans yeah, yeah. were to attack Greece rather than Sicily. So he moved an entire panzer unit of 90,000 troops oh my gosh, yeah. away from Italy to, uh, to Greece, yeah. where the Allies had no intention of going. Um, I mean, fair play to this, to this Welsh homeless guy who died in St. Pancras. And the, yeah, the uh, Welsh homeless guy who... Who killed himself thinking that his his life was was absolutely worthless? Yeah, um, kind of was in his death. He was more useful in death than life. To be fair. Mm. Well, in death, he was able to fool the Nazis, and ultimately, you know, this could have been a, a huge yeah, turning point the on the war. Of the war. Um, Ninety, and because of this, Hitler was actually planning a huge offensive against the Soviet Union a week after the Allies invaded Sicily, but because the invasion was successful. He cancelled that that huge operation and recalled a fifth of the entire German army from the Eastern Front to protect the Mediterranean, America. thus giving the Soviet Union a Time bigger trip. advantage in pushing pushing further west. There so yeah, That's this awesome. could have been a huge turning point in the war. And it was all because of one Welsh homeless man by the name of Glyndor Michael. Glyndor Michael. Was his name. Oh, cool. I, was Poor ask, I mean, yeah. he uh, 
I mean, imagine trying to get that clearance now. What do you want to do? Oh, yeah, we just want to actually get a dead body of someone who's died in London and just put it on a boat, take it out to sea, drop it to it. Just, you know. I, know this is... I mean, I don't, I'm not sure it would happen nowadays, would it? I know, military intelligence. I think they would, especially in a World War situation. They totally would. But yeah, that's great, though. That's a great story. And, and it goes to show just how important intelligence, um, intelligence networks and spies and spy craft is in winning wars and particularly because yeah. in the biggest disadvantage i guess the nazis had in world war ii is that f- the fuhrer hitler himself made all the military strategy he made the final decisions everything had to go through him and um, once he once he really got off his rocker towards the end of the war he was not making rational decisions no mm. yeah. no yeah well yeah mussolini and during this was saying to hitler i really think you're being tricked mate I really, think, right. <laughs> I really, really think they're going to attack Sicily. They're definitely going to attack. Oh, oh, yep, they're attacking Sicily right now. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, no, he he warned Hitler, and Hitler didn't listen to him. Thankfully, thankfully he didn't. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, I I think it's quite a well known story now. But it's uh, I I found about, out about it for the first time this week, and I thought it was very interesting. It's a great story. Yeah. Uh, Martin, what did you learn this week? Well, I need to ask you guys a question. Um, how much do you value wildlife, and in particular birds? I hate them. No. I hate them with a passion. No, I'm, I'm pretty pro the environment, pretty pro birds. Yeah. You're pro it's birds. Probably, it's well, my official stance. Well, that's good. And so is this village in India, which, um, which well, it, it, did it, it did its absolute utmost to save a nest of baby birds. And okay. so... In this little village uh, in Tamil Nadu, uh, in the Sivanga district of India, yeah. apologies for my pronunciation there, it's definitely wrong, they, they basically <clears throat> they found a, uh, a little nest of birds that was well nesting on the main switchboard uh, of the town which controls their streetlights. So, so it's six o'clock each evening. This man, it was his job to go out and turn on the lights on the switchboard and light up light up the town in the evening so everyone could walk around safely. And um, and this one evening, he, he got to the switchboard and he found these baby birds nesting there with their mother. And so he went back to the villagers and there uh, was about, about 250 people, I think, in this village, 100, 120 houses, maybe, maybe, maybe slightly more, and, um, and said, no, guys, I, I can't turn on these lights. Um, I can't disturb this nest because these baby birds and the the family are living there. Uh, yeah. And so they got round had a village meeting, and um, and they decided that they weren't going to turn on those lights and use the switchboard until the baby birds had hatched and flown away. Oh. And so they waited for forty five days, forty five oh. days, uh, without any lights in the village. Uh, as a result, and so their kindness. Uh, save the birds these birds life and i think is a maybe a little bit of a lesson to us all to um to care for nature and uh, and forego your street lights if it's going to save some baby birds that is great oh that's, so that's, that's a heartwarming really awesome. story yeah. yeah it is a little bit isn't it it's not as exciting as yours alex but uh i thought it was a, ni- a nice a nice light one to yeah, go with all so. the, that was lovely. the misery that really nice. usually yeah i think it's a nice transition people from, in. from world war Two death and destruction heroics to um <laughs> To saving humanity, saving birds. That's nice. Exactly. Exactly. So I guess they couldn't. They, there was no other way they couldn't like move the nest, could they? No, they did. Well, he didn't want to disturb the nest because otherwise the the mother would have flown off and apparently left the birds and they would have just died. Mm-hmm. Um, and this Indian robin, this Indian robin, uh, apparently there aren't there aren't too many of them left. They've been their numbers have been declining, like pretty much every every species around the world. Um, so they they uh, they decided to forego their streetlights. So very very nice of them. That's wonderful. And yeah, they got them in the end, right? They just waited. They just waited. 45 yeah. days. Just a little bit of patience to give those birds a chance. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. I mean, probably they found that a week later, another one had found the original nest and occupied it again. Yeah. But, um... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they tried to help those it didn't say. It didn't say that they took any precautions to prevent this happening again in the future. So, uh, I mean... Well, I, mean, I birds, guess it could happen again. Those birds would have would have left the nest and learned that the street lights were a fantastic place to build nests. So, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. I imagine so. I imagine so. Well, how about you, Robin? 
what did I learn this week? It's it feels like I can't follow up those two stories. Those are two really nice stories, uh, really good stories. And mine's not a story. It's just a fact that was in the news this week to do with physics, um, which is that uh, according to physics, the standard model of how our universe works uh, acknowledges four fundamental forces that govern everything. They are gravity, electromagnetism, and something called the strong force and something called the weak force, which is great. <laughs> Science, love it. Um, <laughs> But there have been new experiments, uh, the results of which have been recently announced, uh, which uh, on particles, you know, things like the Large Hadron Collider and some other uh, laboratories like that, um, doing particle physics experimentations, on particles called muons. And their observations suggest that they may be on the cusp of discovering a fifth fundamental force that governs the universe. And this fifth fundamental force might explain um, something that some scientists argue for, which is dark energy, the sense that, oh. particularly to explain the universe is expanding, and actually as it expands, it seems to be speeding up at the, the rate at which it expands. And some scientists have suggested for a while now that it's this dark energy, this kind of invisible energy that comes from nowhere and just seems to exist. Um, a lot of other physicists are skeptical of that, but they think that maybe this fifth, this potential fifth force might actually be uh, what is currently being called dark energy, but isn't. Um, so yeah, that's, Wow. That's what I, there we go. Was, I learned just, this week, yeah. Physicists, they're just on another level at the moment, aren't they? I mean, like, what? They're really making what? leaps and bounds, aren't they? Yeah. They're like, oh, we might have discovered a, another determining energy thing, determining, yeah. like, the universe makeup. What? <laughs> we found the God. I'm over here making a podcast. How can you, <laughs> how can you found that out? <laughs> That's not fair. How do yeah. you just find that out? With there's lots always of a question, funding, isn't it? I think. <laughs> <laughs> there's always this how, like where do, what what research do you conduct to find that? I mean, I mean, there's plenty of answers, I'm sure, but it just seems like a, uh, yeah. How do you, yeah? How do you start to get into that field in the first place? Yeah, amazing, amazing, wonderful. Yeah, that's at this that point that really Homer exciting. Simpson just goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't get over though. Having said all that, like. There's something very. They've got these really complicated names for the first two, and then what was it? The strong, strong energy strong and the weak, and the weak force. energy. <laughs> and then this is the strong energy. Yeah, this is, the, this weak is the weak energy. <laughs> yeah, you can tell that gravity and electromagnetism were discovered and identified a long time ago because all of modern science is just strong force, yeah, weak force, yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> Sudden yeah. syndrome. Yeah. Um, so uh, before we get into the main topic of this week's podcast. Shall we do comments of the week? So I've got a comment from Willa Wolf, uh, and this is about biscuits. Remember last week on the podcast, we were discussing oh, yeah. Yeah. biscuits. Mm -hmm. First mm -hmm. of all, there, there was a couple of things we wanted to know. Basically, what an American biscuit was, because we were talking about our biscuits. Yes, versus American that's biscuits. right. Yeah, yeah. And also, we asked the question last week, what were, why are digestive biscuits called digestive biscuits? Yes. And Willa Wolf says, the whole biscuit thing. Our biscuit is like a flaky bread roll, which is not how I imagined it, actually. Flaky, flaky bread, bread roll. roll. I thought Ooh. it was going to be more like a scone kind of thing. Exactly, Ooh. yeah. So that's that's insightful. Thank you. And then he said, and I recently learned that, yes, your digestive biscuit was indeed created to help with the digestion or to put it another way to help you go. So there you go. There you go. Thank they you. could have come up with a uh, a nicer name for it. I kind of <laughs> wish I actually didn't know that now. But. Are, they, are they particularly fibrous? I'm not even sure. I don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Get back Although, to us, at the time they invented <laughs> about was, the fiber content. <laughs> that, was, that was the golden age of uh, home remedies, isn't it? Like this thing that's will true. grow your hair back. This thing will help you go. So now. Nah. Exactly. Mm, that's true. Yeah. Here's here's just some. <laughs> this probably has hardly any fiber in it at all. <laughs> like here, have this. Yeah. Uh, oh, but yeah. No, thank you. For, thank you for that. Let. I, I can never learn enough about biscuits. Good. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny about that? Funny Nothing. About I, that? Can never, I, mean, I can never, I can never learn enough about biscuits. <laughs> I agree. I just love that. <laughs> Leave that in isolation. Just let the let that comment stand on its own. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good well I mean I'm glad that's you mentioned good. Alex because that's uh, a fairly uh, positive outlook on life and uh, on last week's podcast I think one of the questions Martin asked in the quiz was what's the world's rarest 
kind of blood type uh, was that it um, and Morgan yes. c- commented, yeah. uh, I think Martin said, what type of blood type are you? And both of us said, oh, we don't know. Uh, but Mordith commented saying, judging by Alex's past dispositions, what's the betting his blood type is B negative? Oh, what? <laughs> but, Brutal. But Brutal's then Mordith says, there. outside chance it's B positive, though. Oh, yeah, true. That's, I mean, true. it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... It's, it's accurate. It's <laughs> <laughs> You're not negative. You're not really negative. Not negative I'm, I'm trying, trying to be a B positive. Trying my hardest B to be positive. a B positive. Yeah. That New Year's um, resolution, yeah. you're keeping up to it. It's good. It's good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's easier to be be more positive this year, I think. Now I'm living living in Edinburgh. It feels, I don't know, lots more outside time. That feels. That sounds like I'm in prison. <laughs> yard time, yeah. <laughs> lots more, lots more yard time here. Um, yeah, no, just generally nicer area. So, yeah, good, and plus good. things, things to look up. forward to. Vaccine yes. rollout, sure, yeah. Nice, nice. You know, yeah, very true. Positive outlook. Um, so yeah, good, good, good. Well, I've actually, I've actually got a, uh, a review for us oh. uh, this week. Oh, cool. This one's from Nuclear Pasta, who left a review on uh, Apple Podcasts amazing. slash iTunes. Uh, so if you if you if you guys want to is it Nuclear a Pasta with well, cheese? You can. It's it's not Nuclear Pasta with cheese, but it's Nuclear Pasta with two A's. Pasta. 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 Yeah. So this is titled a wee poem for you guys, and it goes like this. There once was a radio station where Martin couldn't hide his frustration, Ooh. and Alex would strop. Because they just couldn't stop Robin mentioning castration. Ah. Oh, that wow. is very that's good. Incredible. That and is that's from Michael brilliant. in Bonnie Dundee. And he also says, love the show, guys. Oh. Keep it up. So thank oh, you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. And thanks for your effort there. Incredible. <laughs> yeah, incredible. <laughs> oh, I want to frame it. <laughs> yeah, you know, actually, that's worthy. That's incredible. That's worthy of it. Oh, well, how, the how many, how many follow... How, how many subscribers would we have to get hmm. for you to get that tattooed onto yourself somewhere? No, I'm not going to say this because uh, <laughs> I, I was bound to, it's bound to backfire. Yeah, you came dangerously some, close to something. dyeing your hair blue, didn't you? After that, uh... I did, I did. And if people, if people, well, I'm not going to dye my hair blue anymore. But if people do want to follow us on Twitch, you can see our live performances of the Just Interesting podcast when we next do it, which which may well may even be next week potentially. We might do it again next week. Did we say, okay. We haven't discussed it, but yeah, yeah I did not know that was a thing. But yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, why not? Now, then head on over to uh, twitch.tv uh, forward slash just underscore interesting. Mm-hmm. Cool. And uh, follow Twitch anyway because Martin and Alex are currently playing through a way out together. It's co-op. Heaven. We are getting yard time. Yeah, we are getting yeah, actually, yard time yeah. indeed. We're Escaping getting a lot prison. of yard time at the moment. Yeah. yeah, best double team you'll ever see on Twitch. That's what I said. And that's what I'm sticking to. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so uh, with that all said and done, let's move on to the main topic of today's podcast, which is people who were worshipped as gods. Um, now, I think each of us has gone and found a person who was worshipped as a god by somebody. Uh, and they're all pretty interesting stories, I think. But it was suggested by Martin, who was inspired by current affairs, because, well, Martin, yes. I'll, I'll let you take over and introduce well, as as we've been told a billion times this week uh, about the sad passing of Prince Philip, and one Wait, of the things, what? yeah, well, yeah well, oh Prince my goodness, Philip died. He, well, apparently, so. yeah, your Duke Alex, when? your local Duke, has yeah. died. Exactly. exactly. No one told me. Yeah, it's been on the news. Uh, not really, not really. Few and few and far between. Um, but yes, unfortunately, Prince Philip did die at the age of ninety nine. So he didn't get the letter handed to him from his wife, unfortunately. Um, but what this did bring up was a story about uh, two villages in Vanuatu. And uh, and in particular, this particular island called Tanna, where they thought that the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, was a godlike spiritual figure. And, um, and so there's this connection between Prince Philip and this island of Tanna, because the people of Tanna believe that uh, the, the Duke was fr- originally from Tana. He he transformed into Prince Philip so he get he could get close to the Queen, who of course is well, at the time that they started believing in this, way back in the fifties, I think it was, 
the queen, of course, one of the most powerful people in the world. And so to give their island more prominence on the global stage, they believe, or did believe, and some still do, that Prince Philip was actually originally from Tanner and is a spiritual godlike figure who's basically made his way to the top of the world. I mean, yeah. Which I think is just amazing. So do they think he's so, um, reincarnated or do they think he can literally transformed into Prince Philip? Uh, so, so, so from what I, from what I believe, um, they think that a uh, a tribesman left the island right. in 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 his original spiritual form to find a powerful wife overseas. That's 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 how it's said mm. by uh, by some by an expert called Mister Huffman, who's uh, who's an expert in in the history of this. And so it goes on to say that ruling the UK with the help of the Queen, he was trying to bring peace and respect. Uh, uh, for tradition to England and other parts of the world and so the idea that that he would do this and then later on he would return to this this village of Tanner uh, as as a hero but there's kind of another another element to it and that they believe that the only thing preventing him from coming back to the island of Tanner uh, was white people's stupidity stupidity jealousy greed and perpetual fighting I mean and so, so they yeah, so they basically believe that Prince Philip uh, had this mission to plant the seed of Tanner uh, at the heart of the Commonwealth and the Empire. So everything that Tanner stands for, so, so these things of, of you know of tradition yeah. and of, of their culture and their way of life. Yeah. And so and so yeah, so they see him as basically a godlike hero who is uh, who's basically uh, elevating their ways around the world. Hmm. This must have um, been a devastating week for them. Exactly, but but there's the but the other side of it is there's this whole thing of Prince Philip returning home to Tanner, and they never say whether he returns as in human form or whether uh, he returns in a spiritual kind of form. Mm. So it's unclear whether they're going to move on to another member of kind of a member of the royal family as as this deity, or whether they'll kind of they'll put it to rest now that Prince Philip has has um, has passed. Uh, it must be said that this, when this particular movement originated way back, way back in the um, in the nineteen fifties, and, and potentially before then, they're not entirely sure of the exact year. That um, uh, th- there are thousands of people that believe this in these small villages, and now it's uh, several hundred. So again, the, the mm. kind of the people that um, have this as a central core belief has definitely diminished over the years. It must be said. Right. But Prince Philip has has actually bought into this. Um, oh. He's appeared publicly and accepted their reverence <clears throat> he sent letters to them and photographs of himself i think and i think that it's probably more for uh, for kind of uh, tr- tribal uh, commonwealth relations as yeah, opposed to keep anything them else side, yeah. exactly exactly um but it's interesting i mean yeah. a, li- a little bit later on in 2007 some of the tribesmen were flown to the uk for a uh, channel 4 documentary so they actually did did end up meeting him huh. then he never actually went back to the island they asked him if he would he would head back with them he didn't, <laughs> of course he couldn't yeah. at the time and he's well, and of course he he didn't uh, but prince charles i believe has since oh. they don't see prince charles as uh, as a god yet like they like they did with uh, with prince philip but yeah they viewed him uh, for for a number of years and some still do as a uh, like a, a spiritual deity yeah. um, in in this particular remote community, which is just absolutely bizarre. So, yeah, unfortunately for them, they're in a, a period of mourning at the moment and yeah. having lots of ceremonies, uh, you know, marking his death and I guess celebrating his life. But, um, but yeah, times are yeah. times are changing in the in the village of Tana. Yeah, I mean, so the theory was that he he went out to plant the seed. Of Tana, yes, um, yes, of their of their traditions, and the only reason he hasn't returned is because of, uh, you know, the the the, the, the terrible things that um, the white the white people do. Yeah, I mean, the way they describe mm. us is pretty accurate. I can't knock them there. Yeah, um, but what yeah, no. do we know much about their values and things? Because I was surprised to learn, pleasantly surprised to learn this week that actually Prince Philip was writing back in the nineteen eighties about climate change and the science of climate change and how it was overwhelmingly obvious that we had adversely affected the climate and would have to do something about it and that was back in the 80s i mean obviously it was the first science about it occurred i think the late 60s and throughout the 70s but you know, you got the 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 royal consort you know second most important person mm-hmm. in our country probably um 
uh, the British Empire still uh, writing about it and talking about it. So that's pretty progressive for the time, uh, for the 1980s in particular. Yeah, so absolutely. That maybe that's <clears throat> some truth to that. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the um, from my point of view, it seems like yeah. As I as I say, they're trying to they're trying to elevate the customs of of their land. It says mm. that they were trying to bring peace and, res- and respect for tradition. Well, they're living in a community that rejects a lot of of um of modern technology. Mm. Uh, they don't have any kind of any mobile phones or any links to the outside world and society. So I think there's this there's this idea that um that, that yeah they're trying to uh, kind of remain um true to themselves and true to true to their traditional ways of life and almost trying to to, to spread this around the world i mean I know there's been a few interpretations and one is that it could be a a kind of reaction to colonialism yes. um and and kind of taking back a little bit that control that that control that was and power that was lost um by because due to basically, I guess the uh, the royal family and the empire taking over so much mm. of the world from communities like this, mm. and so it almost seems like okay, well, if we believe that actually one of one of us, one of ours, is at the top mm. of um mm. of global power, then it kind of almost gives us a little bit of of that power back that was taken um, from us in the past. So there's, I guess, there's that side of it too. That's a that's a good way of looking at it, actually. Yeah, yeah, an yeah. interesting one, anyway. An interesting yeah. one, um, definitely. Yeah. Hmm. Gosh, what well, that, Martin? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't want to detract from uh, Prince Philip's godly status, but uh, the story I chose actually also takes place on the island of Tanna in Vanuatu. No, really. <laughs> on, on, the east, on the eastern side of the island, <laughs> they, they have a very, very different religious practices. Um, and they don't worship Prince Philip, but this was the start of a cargo cult focusing on a man named John Frum. And this is... Actually, a little bit of a cop-out, to be honest, because we don't know if John Frum was a real man. Like, we d- we don't have an official record of his existence. Yeah. We don't know if that's his real name. But it's thought that John Frum was an American GI during World War II that mm-hmm. visited the island of uh, Tanna. And this re- so this religion came to pass. It rose in, the, like, the late 1930s, um, However, there are also claims that it started in 1949 or the 1910s, oh, um, right. but I'm not okay. really sure. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I think that's just n- not uh, not very obvious records yeah. of when this yeah. this cropped up. Well, it's they, kind of like hearsay, to be yeah. honest. I mean, these are really, is, these communities are so remote, aren't they? Yeah. So there isn't exactly the record taking that, <laughs> that we find elsewhere. Mm. But uh, this this is. Um, this movement sprung up apparently because it was influenced by religious practices in the local area from Sulphur Bay, which is on the east side of Tanner. And they worshipped uh, a god called Kira Paraman, which is a god associated with a mountain there on the island. Um, and in some versions of a, with like a local story, a native man named Manahivi, using the alias John Frum, began appearing among the native people of Tanna, dressed in a Western-style coat, uh-huh. assu- um, assuring the people that he would bring them houses, clothes, food, and transport. Um, and then there is another theory that John Frum is actually an induced spirit vision from taking a, a local plant called Carva, which I guess is a hallucinogenic sort of plant, maybe like um, similar to what, what's that plant called? Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, yeah. Ayahuasca. Um, Martin's choice. But yeah, no, a common a common thought with this is that John Fromm was an American GI who visited the island during the war and brought lots of cargo with him, shared this out with the locals. Perhaps he was he was particularly kind and got to know them and uh, shared some of, some of their resources, some Coca-Cola or some other luxuries from the modern world. And yeah. then when he left, they began. They began this religion dedicated to John Frum. What is it about this island that they <laughs> seem to just 
just worship worship people that come there that is that is yeah that is a uh, an interesting one i, can, I mean i guess i, I guess believe that you said the same one yeah. think about it like from their point of view i guess if they are just untouched by outside civilizations and then mm-hmm. and then in comes someone with all the luxuries of the modern world riding on a on a mechanized boat um <laughs> With technology that they'd never seen before, yep. yeah, I mean, you 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 might think that they're a god. To be honest, it's yes. not the the least logical thing in the world. Yeah, and, yeah, and- true. I mean, I mean, the island's made up of villages, isn't it? And um, has has roughly thirty thousand people. I've seen, so it's not it's not the t- the tiniest of tinies. But I mean, you can compare that to the whole world. Like the small community. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, there's this recurring pattern with this guy coming. And going away, similar to the Prince Philip thing, it's like he's gone away and they think he'll come back. Is that kind of the root of this John from thing? He did go away and come back repeatedly, but then one day he never comes back. So there's this kind of like, oh, he will come back one day. They're kind of like it's the same thing with like any kind of Messiah in the Judeo Judeo Christian uh, religions. The sense of they will return and save us. Yeah. Yeah. Um. No, that's an it's an interesting point. Uh, I mean, I feel like there could be some really good research on this like topic of why this island in particular seems to I don't know choose yeah yeah choose gods <laughs> <laughs> that visit and leave the island. Um, it's a uh, it's really interesting. But in 1957, there's uh, so there was a whole John Frum movement, and the leader of the John Frum movement created the Tanner Army which was, unlike its name, oh, okay. a non-violent ritualistic society that organized military-style parades of men with faces painted in ritual colors and wearing white t-shirts with the letters T-A USA, <laughs> uh, Tanner Army USA. <laughs> um, and this parade takes place every year on February going. 15th. Oh, wow. The date, the date on which followers believe John Frum will return and which is observed as John Frum Day in Vanuatu. Wow. This is amazing. That's crazy. This is amazing. I love it. Oh, it's too late for us oh. to become gods of any small tribe, isn't it? <laughs> World's been explored. <laughs> yeah, too, much, too much pressure. <laughs> too much pressure. Too much pressure. Well, yeah. Couldn't handle that. <laughs> Head there's a big metallic uh, statue to you, Robin. Yeah. A robotic-looking statue in the middle of the island. No. no I think no. this... Um, this yearly celebration still goes on today, but I'm not actually sure how many of them still do it sincerely, or <laughs> or it's just become a kind of local tradition. Two old guys, um, yeah. It's, it's, it's become like um, yeah. Krampus, it's like Krampus. Everyone, yes, everyone Krampus. does it for fun. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you you get what's that? There's there's that island in Italy, isn't there? Is it in Italy um, where there's like a native tribe that's untouched by civilization in italy and the, there was someone that went th- maybe i'm not thinking of italy maybe i'm thinking somewhere else but wasn't there someone who who went to the island a few years ago and got killed with a bow and arrow oh, yes. no that was oh i thought that was yes. in the do you remember that story i thought that was in the Amazon. maybe i'm wrong that probably would make more sense <laughs> yeah. uh, than italy i don't know why i thought of italy italy well known for why, why am i thinking of italy for i mean it could be italy i just Native tribes. I just feel like it's unlikely that at this point in history that there'd um, be a native tribe untouched in Italy. This seems odd. Um. Yeah, I think I'm thinking of something totally different. Um, but yeah, I just think whenever like you see the see like helicopters going over and the tribes people like looking up at the looking up mm. at the helicopter where the footage is being mm. taken from, you just think, what are they thinking? What are they thinking when they see yeah. this? Mm-hmm crazy machine and it's an old trope of literature um, going back a long time to at least if not before you know the arrival of cortez and the other spaniards in south america who, and you know they claimed that the aztecs saw them as gods um not true they didn't but that's that was what they claimed um and it's kind of similar to the example i've got today which funny we seem to be working backwards in time gone from Duke of Edinburgh, who's just died to john from who was in the 1940s or perhaps earlier to we do know the beginning of this um, thing, which is in the 1840s in India, or what is now actually Pakistan, um, half a dozen Muslim Indians 
started a religious cult. And they devoted their lives to worshipping a being called Nikal Sain. And the last member of the Nikal Sainis uh, died in 2004 in Abbottabad, mm, Pakistan. Wow. So starting in the 1840s, continued until 2004 when the last member of this cult died. But Nikal Sain... That must be sad, being yeah. the last <laughs> member of a cult. <laughs> but we know... Knowing that it's going to die. We know that Nick Alsane was actually uh, a fellow called John Nicholson. Brig- oh. Brigadier General John Nicholson, who was the district commissioner of this part of the Northern Territories in India when it was part of the British Empire. Um, and when the British Empire was trying to take over Afghanistan at the same time. And uh, he was quite remarkable for his time. He was a hero to the British uh, because he was instrumental in their expansion and he worked for the British East India Company. Um, and he was instrumental in uh, conquering northern parts of India and in establishing British authority there and in propagating it because um, he impressed everybody with his foul temper and his six foot two height and big beard, which in the 1840s, the average height was about five foot six. So he was he was pretty big, yeah, cool. pretty big for the time. Um, and uh, he was uh, enthusiastic and unrelenting in his enforcement of British rule. Um, he became district commissioner uh, over the North Punjabi and Afghan tribes of the Banu region. Uh, and he was known for flogging pretty much anybody for any reason whatsoever. Uh, in fact, the Sir John Lawrence, who was a friend of his, criticised him uh, quite vocally um, for flogging people even when he didn't have the authority to do it he would just flog them uh, he, and he also criticized him for his fondness for humiliating indian leaders um uh, for example the time that he uh publicly grabbed an imam you know a muslim religious leader and shaved his beard which is a hugely shameful thing to do mm. um because the imam didn't greet him in the street oh, goodness uh yeah uh, that wow. was, he's basically a dick. He's basically a dick. Basically a dick, basically a dick yeah. Um, but he was also like a dick, a, he was a violent dick too. So he um, he was his job was to enforce the law. And one way he did this very took it on personally. Uh, one time he single handedly went and found the chieftain of a tribe of bandits. Uh, he fought him, killed him, cut his head off, and displayed it on his desk as a warning to everybody. Uh, he ordered that no Indians were allowed to ride next to white men. If an Indian on horseback passed a white man, he was supposed to dismount and bow. Hmm. Uh, Dear. Yep. <laughs> uh, mm. And <laughs> most famously, during the Indian Mutiny, he was very uh, important in putting down the Indian Mutiny in 1857. Uh, and one famous incident is when he... Uh, ordered the and oversaw the immediate summary execution of all the cooks, Indian cooks of a regiment, um, after they discovered that one of them had poisoned the soup of the officers uh, as part one of the mutineers. Um, wow. He also um, exposed Indian soldiers who might have disguised themselves as civilians during the mutiny by simply having all civilians under his authority, well, actually, sorry, all civilians he would come across, um, he'd round them up with his soldiers, have the civilians paraded in front of him, and he would just decide whether or not they were soldiers in disguise and kill them. Based on no evidence whatsoever. What a, yeah. what an And even at the time, he was person. criticized, including by his friends, as I mentioned, um, for mm-hmm. his harsh treatment. But he was also very successful in keeping the British Empire uh, going. So um, he, was, he was a hero. And there are statues to him. Um, there was a statue to him in Delhi, unsurprisingly, after India became independent. They sent it to, uh, back to his home country of Ireland. Uh, and um, the same statue was Surprise it was unveiled by it. Lord Mountbatten, the uncle of the Duke of Edinburgh, ah, yeah. um, in 1960. The statue that the Indians sent back from Delhi was unveiled in Ireland by Lord Mountbatten, um, who was the last viceroy of India. Uh, and there's an obelisk to him outside Islamabad, um, which is... Uh, put up in 1890 or by 1890 but the point is that this um, cult was born out of fear and respect of him in the 1840s Mm. but he was a staunch christian and he was disgusted by idolatry and by all foreign religions 
and um, the worship of false gods as he saw it. So he actually tried to stamp out the cult. <laughs> he tried to eradicate it during his lifetime, but that just made the cultists respect him even more. And uh, he became right. he became <laughs> kind of this, this, this godlike figure to them. And eventually he became more of a saint in because they're a Muslim cult, so they don't, obviously there's only one Allah, but he became more of a saint and then eventually the cult just died out, as I said, in 2004. So, yeah. 2004, yeah. <laughs> there, there's, I mean, I know he's a, like, sounds like a horrible person, but there's something quite funny about him really hating that <laughs> yeah. everyone's worshipping him. And he's <laughs> like, I keep killing you and beating you and being incredibly racist. And then, <laughs> and then like, I love you. And he's like, stop it. Just there's stop it. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. It's true. But it's funny because I hadn't thought about it. Wow. Sorry, Martin. <laughs> That'd be funny if it wasn't so awful. Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> it, um, yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> but it kind of oh, goes back dear. to what you were saying about your uh, example, Martin, which is it's a way perhaps of coping with colonialism, of as the colonized kind of dealing with these oppressors, essentially. You know, I'm not saying yes. Duke of Edinburgh was, a, was an oppressor, not in a direct sense, obviously. He, was the late yeah, symbolically yeah um, maybe the conquerors the rulers um yeah just kind of i wonder if that's where it came from just dealing with the shock of this horrible horrible man so just marching in and imposing british rule in his very tyrannical way yeah yeah again i feel like i've read and seen a dozen or so sci-fi and fiction fantasy stories with this kind of thing going on where people go mad and there's a cult that worships the villain or something you know um but it's true there are historical examples for it so what i mean what was the cult was still around mm. till 2004 what were their beliefs that, were, that he was going to come um, back at some no point, they or? just believed he had kind of holy powers like there's one tradition around him that <laughs> they had a tradition that um one time he beheaded a man and then stuck the head back on and brought him back to life. Which, you know, hmm. the first part of that sounds plausible. The second part, maybe not so much. Yeah. yeah, I don't, don't doubt um, that. And stuff like that. And his grave, his grave is still there in Delhi. And it looks like it's still fairly well preserved, hmm. but it's fairly, no one really goes to worship it. But I do think the cultists used to gather yeah. there and kind of, there were, stories about his spirit would wander the graveyard but not in a kind of spooky who mm. sense in a kind of ah uh, there's the noble <laughs> deity i see nickel sane you know it's not not quite turning water into wine it's the same yeah not the same, the same ring to him bring him yeah. like jesus life. goes to the wedding at cana kicks over all the <laughs> wine jars and he's like eh, take that oh mate bring it back again there you go what was into wine it's not quite the same <laughs> It's like you've done yeah. you've done nothing. Really. Jesus kills nothing Lazarus <laughs> and then brings him back from the dead. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. A, that's an example. Yeah. Wow. So there you go. Well, that's I mean, crazy, crazy that it I lasted know, for right? so long. Though. Yes, um, yes. Um, yeah, really determined cult. I mean, yeah. I mean, all of these still going like to a certain certain extent, um, or like we're going for. Yeah, it'd be interesting Ages. to see where the Duke of Edinburgh one yeah. goes, how long that lasts, and whether it transforms. Yes, anyway. I mean, as I, as I say, yeah, as I say, there's I think there's a few options. It's, it's dropped from several thousand people at, at its peak to just a few hundred, but it will be interesting to see if they kind of they uh, attach this, um, yeah, this this t- I guess title mm. to to anyone else in the royal family, or if it's just reserved for for Prince Philip. Because um, it seems like he was the one who left the island and became, uh, well, beca- became this this powerful uh, figure representing the island of Tanna yeah. in the British Empire. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, we'll see. We shall see. But I, I imagine that perhaps the uh, it will fizzle out a little bit more with this, especially if they if they don't see any. Uh, dramatic change in the kind of the spiritual sense of him returning to the island. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sim- cer- ceremonial and symbolic, maybe, as opposed to uh, anything else. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe there should be a case study, though, because this could be proof of, you know, 
I think an opportunity for science to study and to like, oh, God's real? <laughs> like, yes, everything they predicted did happen after Prince Thriller there we died go. and returned. Yeah, you know? yeah. Perfect opportunity, yeah. Robin, perfect. Maybe Prince Andrew will go over there as a new ambassador. Well, if Prince Philip comes back in a few days' time, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we'll know for sure. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, on that lovely note, shall we have a quiz? Let's. So, welcome to today's quiz. As always, we'll have ten questions with a bonus question in case of a tie. And no pressure today, lads, because Martin, this is your chance to get level pegging with all of us. Alex, this is your chance to take the lead. So, I don't think I've ever been in the lead. It's the entirety of this podcast's existence. Oh, no, you have. You totally. No, yes, you, you have. You, you've won a series. Def- I don't think. I don't think I have. You know. I do. I don't you know. No, you're at the lead at the beginning of season three. Definitely. Definitely. If I have been, then it's been for like one episode tops. <laughs> well, maybe it'll be a second. We'll find out. But first, in order to answer the questions, you need buzzers, gentlemen. Play me your buzzers, Martin. I've gone for one that's very close to my heart. <laughs> that was not what I was expecting. <laughs> that was, no, Alan Partridge. I was so oh, expecting oh, Delia. I thought that was Delia oh. too. Yeah. <laughs> Alex, what's yours? Well, I have gone for one that's very close to my heart. Um, ah, the love French, French champagne. It's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna, can I distinguish clearly between the ah oh, oh, at the beginning? Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> We'll find out. We shall see. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Well, fingers on buzzers, gentlemen, because question number okay. one is coming your way, and it is, to make things easy, a closest wins. A nice gentle start to the quiz. Okay. okay. So, closest wins. How many McDonald's restaurants are there worldwide? <laughs> worldwide. Worldwide. Oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't even how know. To even, how, how, to, how to work this out? That's what I'm trying to think. How far do you go? How low do you go? You <laughs> just don't know. Um, 20. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean... Oh. Um, okay, <laughs> okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do the honourable thing and go first, Alex. Yeah, that's very noble of you, Martin. Uh-huh! I'm really, really glad that you decided that. <laughs> there are... Uh-huh. <clears throat> how many per person? That's the question. 112,000. Okay. Oh, that's a damn good Is that a loss? <laughs> I was th- I honestly I was thinking not too <laughs> far away. Um the French champagne. Mm-hmm. I'll go for a nice even one hundred thousand. Alex is closest. There are only Thirty nine thousand one hundred and ninety eight McDonald's restaurants worldwide. Oh well, I don't think only thirty nine thousand. Yeah, really. Yeah. Okay, there's about wow. fifteen hundred in the UK, which is yeah. not as many as I thought I, there would be. I, I thought there, I thought there'd be a few more. I didn't think there'd be tons more than that. But I was just thinking with the landmass that we have, I was thinking that other countries would have more. Actually, maybe. that's a good point. Yeah. Our density is high enough that we don't need so many. Yeah, but there must there just must be some countries they haven't quite launched into yet. Um, yeah, I know that still thirty nine thousand. Yeah, this is still quite a lot. Yeah, and growing presumably. Yes, Subway yeah. is the most popular, isn't it? They, they've got the yeah. most branches. Subway's got loads. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, I think there's all the franchises way more, yes. way denser. Square um, mile of London, you'll have ten subways. Yeah. Also, and McDonald's then, tend to be pretty massive, don't they? Whereas a subway can be fit into basically a closet. That's <laughs> true. Subway may have more, but the seating area is like two to four people can sit in any any single exactly. subway in the city. Yeah. Whereas, it, yeah, McDonald's always bigger. Okay, on to question two, and it's one nil to Alex. Okay. Who is the only person in the UK who can drive without a licence? <laughs> can say Prince Philip. <laughs> uh, Alex, I, I heard you. Buzz? Is it Queen Elizabeth II? It is. It is indeed. Or perhaps we should just say the monarch, <laughs> given the way things are looking. Um, who knows? This by, by the time this quiz goes out. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Uh, yes, the, the Queen Elizabeth II is the only person in the UK who can drive without a license. Because, you know, 
Licenses are actually issued in her name, so I think that's it's a technicality. Oh, it's kind okay. of, she can't issue herself a mm-hmm. license. Uh, um, or she can just say, no, it's fine. I, I've told myself it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> the Korean has <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if she got pulled over for drunk driving. She wouldn't. Never. <laughs> <laughs> could she, could she, like, if she... Not saying this would ever happen, but hypothetically, <laughs> if she crashed into a car, she, could she go over to there, say, like, license and registration... I don't approve of this, actually. And then, like, tear okay. it up. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's an interesting question. Is it a crime if she... Yeah. Could she take other people's <laughs> licenses and say, uh, no, actually, I specifically don't approve of this? Let us know in the yes. comments to this. If you're watching us on YouTube or if there are comments available on your podcast platform of choice, please let us know. Do you think the Queen can do that kind of thing? Anything that's issued in her name, can she go up to an individual and take it from them because she's decided that she doesn't want to issue it to them? Let's if know. the Queen was way more petty and sassy, could she, <laughs> and, could she do this? And, and a traffic cop. <laughs> and a traffic yes. cop. Okay, well, 2 nil to Alex, going into question three. Oh dear. This is definitely a fingers on buzzers because it's a true or false. So 50-50 okay. here. True or false? Fish and insects close their eyes when they sleep. Aha! I heard Martin. That's false. They keep their eyes open. True. That, as in, correct. <laughs> it is false. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> That's really confusing. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. So they, they do keep their eyes open. They do. They sleep they with do. their eyes yeah. open. In the case of insects, I don't even know if they have oh. lids over, with, with which they can close Good their question. eyes. Yeah. But uh, fish do blink, but don't, but they sleep with their eyes open. So that's uh, two one to Alex. Going into question four. How many bones does a giraffe have in its neck? In its neck. And this is not a closest wins. I need I need an answer. I don't know that. You make an What's educated that? guess. You make an educated guess. Never seen a giraffe skeleton. Aha! Have I? No, it Martin. I think has... you buzzed in. Yeah. Yes, it just has just as just as the one. One bone in its neck. Just one long bone. Isn't it? One long bone. <laughs> okay. I, I have no idea. I'm gonna I'm say not... you're wrong. <laughs> okay. Cool. Cool. I'll let you have a go, and then I'll revise my answer. <laughs> Just imagine. I don't mean to laugh. I'm just imagining like one long bone, and it can't like, turn, it can't, like bend its I mean, neck. They move. Anything. They move. The, I mean, they move their necks like crazy, don't they? They are yeah. quite. Yeah. Especially then, when, they, when thinking, they fight. If it's a specific oh, yeah. answer, how how would we guess it? If it was if it was like 112, we're not going to. It's not going to be masses, is it? No. French champagne has always been celebrated for its excellence. Yes, Alex. They have. Six. No, they don't. Okay, I'll give you both one more guess. Okay. Um, to revise your answers. But I, I will say that you're both in the right area. Yeah. Yeah, no, they actually have eight okay. bones in the neck. Okay. Alex, what's your second revised answer? I would say that then, in that case, that they have five bones in the neck. The correct answer is seven. <laughs> you both <laughs> managed to dance oh. around it. Don't. Yeah, they have seven bones in their neck, which, to be honest, I, is a lot fewer than I expected. Way fewer, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so how does it work it. then? Do they just have lots of muscle instead? or I think, I they have, so. I think they're fairly large vertebrae, as well as having lots of muscle. So I think the largest one is about 10 inches, I want to say. Vertebrae is yeah. about 10 inches big, I think. I may have got... Yeah. Maybe 10 centimetres. There's a big difference between 10 centimetres and 10 inches. <laughs> I should, I should have it down. But um, that leaves me on to question number five, and it's still 2-1 to Alex. How many bones does a human oh, have actually, in its actually, neck? Wait, wait a second. Oh. Wait a second. Robin, I missed out on saying that's what she said. Carry on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, I was, I'm glad you did that. I almost made the joke, but I thought that's a bit, that's a bit cruel to my wife. A bit crude, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I thought I'd take up the mantle. Thank you. Um, so question number five is how many bones does a human have in its neck one two three four five. <laughs> oh yep that's a buzz oh, in from the, Alex there's the vertebrae in there we have twelve uh, that's incorrect Martin what, 12, do you have a guess twelve 
one where you've got the main the main spinal uh, i mean I, I imagine that we're talking about the neck we're not talking about like the spinal we're not like talking the about the back, spine the back the vertebrae in the spine at the back no well, but we are I talking about the neck. Le- i think we've got le- I only need one less we got i think we've got less than that okay i'm actually, I'm actually going to go for what was one two it's actually counting. maybe I love this. three four we've got four uh no i'll give you both one more no. guess you can revise your answer Alex went for 12 and Martin went for 4 and you're both wrong I'm just trying to think hmm do we know the bones of the neck that well Mm. the French champagne yes Alex how many was giraffe 8 did you say 7 7 7 did you say yeah I'm going to go 7 I think it's we're the same I was thinking of doing that too. So, so what is your revised answer, Martin? I can't go for the same, can I? Uh, well, can do if you want. No, that's not how this works. Hey, uh, <laughs> it this is. is on the quiz master. I'm saying you can you can both revise your answer and go for the same thing if you like. What? What? If this, I, if... I won't. I won't. You've said it first, so I won't. I won't. Um, I don't know. I'll go, I'll go for. I'll go for nine. The correct answer is seven. Yes, giraffes and yes. humans have the same number of vertebrae in their neck. <laughs> I should have stuck with it. Yeah. Why not? Alex just convinced me. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm so, so it wasn't. It wasn't the closest wins or anything. It was a. Uh, it was just. It was, three, it was one, guessing. And... To Alex, okay. you're in closest wins. We're entitled to guess look, the same I, number. I don't want to win in, a, in a bad way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so question number six. Still plenty of time for Martin to catch up here because uh, it's only three one. Okay. Uh, question number six. What is the largest landlocked country in the world? Mm. Mm. Largest. The largest land- landlocked country, country in the world. In the world. That's a good question. Is it going... Oh, that's, oh crap. Could it be... Aha! Yes. Yeah. Uh, Democratic Republic, uh, People's Republic of Congo. <laughs> it is not. It's not. Don't they have a coast? <laughs> they have a coast, don't they? Do they? Don't they? Maybe I'm wrong. I could my, be wrong. My, um, I yeah, know, I ignore me. I could be wrong about that. But it's not Congo, no. Um, that would be nice. That would have tied in nicely with. Pre- I know, previous, that's what I was yeah. thinking. That's what I thought of it. Hmm. So, Alex, uh, see how it gets. French. Not a fly Different area, um, Kazakhstan. Yes, You're is it actually well it is Kazakhstan? Yeah. No? Question number seven, and it is four one, I think, Oof. to Alex. Oof. There's still time. Yeah. There's still time for Martin time. to do still this. Time. Martin is the comeback king, as he has proved on many occasions. Uh, so he I'm likes to come from counting, behind. Not counting my chickens yet. Is that the saying? Counting my eggs. Chickens. Yeah. Count your chickens before they're chickens. hatched. Yeah. Chickens. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Not counting. <laughs> Son of eggs. Not counting my eggs <laughs> before they're laying. Just, yeah. I thought I was just going insane. <laughs> saying words. I will never count eggs. <laughs> That's the phrase, right? Don't count your yolks before you cracked your eggs. Is that what you're going for? Yeah. Yeah. You, um, you gotta. Count, anyway, question number seven. Without Which counting eggs. Is Shakespeare's longest play? Ooh. You're not making this easy, Robin. You're not making this easy. Longest play. For those of you watching or listening at home, it is the wee small hours of the morning. So actually, this is quite unfair to ask these two, these kind of questions. Uh, Martin, I heard Martin. Let's go for A Tale of... uh, uh, Oh, no, Tame the Shroom. No, I don't want to do that one. Ah, Macbeth, why not? It is not Macbeth. Oh, oh, sorry. Yep, uh, Alex. Another another one of the big ones. Let's go for uh, to be or not to be. Hamlet. It is Hamlet. Ah. It's actually. It is actually. Well Hamlet. Done. It's Hamlet oh, is over no. thirty thousand words long. The shortest one is a comedy of errors, which is fewer than fifteen thousand words. There we go. The reason I said Hamlet is I I once saw a, a production of Hamlet starring Michael Sheen. Um, oh really? There we yeah. go. And it was long. It was very yeah, long. Yeah, I don't think any Hamlet, full, any full production of Hamlet 
doesn't last fewer than four hours normally. Yeah, really yeah. was expensive. I went, I went and saw the Tempest. Oh yeah, at the Globe. That's a good one. At the, at the Globe, that was long. Yeah, that was pretty long. And um, it was it was like a boiling July day, and the heat oh, coming down. You have gosh. to stand up. Oh, no, oh you were standing. standing. And, oh, yeah, my. yeah. There are people like close to passing out. Yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. It wasn't actually. It was it was an experience, but it wasn't necessarily that enjoyable. Yeah, mm. I would not want to stand for a Shakespeare yeah. play. Gosh, Martin, yeah. well done for enduring yeah. that. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, question number eight, and it is okay. Five one. Five one Alex. four. We're just. Playing for a bit of um, I don't know pride here. Aren't I? Yeah, you can you yeah. can make this five four, and then it looks like it was a close run thing, which it would have been. Yeah, it just doesn't seem like that right now. There's kind five. of kind of feel bad. I was very uh, um, angry about the uh, the point situation earlier. Now, <laughs> do you want the? Do, well, you were going to say seven. Do you want the extra point? Make it make it more interesting. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. Well, what type of animal is a waxy monkey? A waxy monkey. A waxy monkey. Yes, a um, waxy monkey. Waxy as in a candle, you know, waxy. Yeah. Oh. Is it a fish? Uh, no. Although okay. Martin buzzed, so you didn't get the right to answer that. I, did, I didn't buzz. I didn't buzz. I, I heard aha. Uh-huh. Oh no, it was ah uh, the oh. French. Sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, that was Alex's. If, yeah. I mean, if it's not a fish, <laughs> then it's a bird. Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> There's only two types of animal in the world, right? <laughs> fishes no, and birds. Yeah. Fish, no. fish I'm and afraid, bird. no. This is this is probably a bit more specific than bird or fish. Okay, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's not too specific. But it's yeah. A waxy monkey. Yeah. Oh, some waxy monkey. Waxy monkey. Sounds 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 maybe amphibian. Um, Aha! What about a frog? Up a frog? It is. It's a tree frog. Oh. Yeah. Oh, nice. Oh, cool. Yeah. Good guess. Yeah. Quite cool looking frogs. They're, they're green. But Colourful stripes, yeah. Oh, nice. A waxy monkey is a frog. Well done. So, 5-2, going on to question 9. I'm afraid it's another country-based question. On average, which country... I love country-based questions. (laughs) (laughs) Which country eats the most cheese per person? On average. Most cheese. Yeah. French. Yes. <laughs> yes. Alex. I mean, that was the obvious, the obvious guess. I'm, I'm, I won't go for France though. Um, how about Sw- Switzerland? No, but I see what you're thinking. Small country, but at the heart of Europe, with lots of cheese is being made around it. Yep. No. Aha! Yes, Martin. I think it's definitely going to be European, isn't it? Probably, most likely. I'm going to go for Germany. Germany is the second most cheese-eating country <sighs> in the world. So close. No, um, they didn't have, didn't have many vegetables when I went there. <laughs> no. Um, I'm sure they do. <laughs> yes, uh, Alex. Sticking to the same area, uh-huh. I'm going to say the Netherlands. Ah, it's between those two. No, it's not the Netherlands. Oh, oh no. no! I was thinking Netherlands. I was, I was, I was eyeing out between the Netherlands and Germany. So, shall I give it to you? Go for it. Okay. Yeah, go for it. You're both very close. You've, you've both listed countries that border. So like Belgium, the right? Czech Republic. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Oh yeah. So, yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. and they got <laughs> exposed <laughs> as a very heavy drinking <laughs> country. Um, so Germany is the second most. Cons- cheese consuming country in the world with 37 kilograms of cheese consumed per year per person on average 37 kilograms the czech republic consumes on average 64 kilograms of cheese per person what that's almost double the second place (laughs) yeah that's my body weight in cheese (laughs) 60 okay 60 64 kilos how much is that per per day 200 grams per day that's a lot of cheese although i've been there and admittedly they've there's like cheese. The cheese is served with a lot of their meals, and there there's not a lot of vegetables. In fact, there are no vegetables. You have to go out of your way to find a place that serves greens as a side dish. Sounds like my kind of place. <laughs> Where do I sign up? It's great <laughs> food. Not going to lie, great food. But stodgy is the word of the day. Okay, yeah. question number ten. Uh, I've lost track of the score now. It was five, five, two, five, two, I think. five, three. I think now maybe. I got. I didn't get that one right though. Five, two. I oh, think still. Yeah, sadly. Uh, question number 10. 
This is uh, eh, this can be a closest win. So why not? Um, historically speaking, back in the 1880s when they first emerged, how many stories did a building have to have to be considered a skyscraper? Sky skyscraper. Aha! Yes, Alan. Round number ten. Yes. Yay! Ten. I win the quiz. I had ten, <laughs> at least ten stories. It was a skyscraper. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Ten points. One point for each floor. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I was. I was a bit scared we were going to get to question ten, and it would be like, now this question's worth ten points. <laughs> yeah, I've done that before. But no, not, the not last time. That would have been a nice one. So yeah. So final score five three. To oh, Alex. Well, that's not too bad. That's all right. That's, that's good. That's, that's yeah. decent. Yeah. Congrat- congratulations, yeah. Alex. It's a, it's a solid you. victory. Thank you very much. Yeah. Congratulations that- to Robin for the successful quiz. <laughs> Only successful because you won it. That's, it would be a different story if Martin <laughs> Absolutely. Was <won>. Fantastic <laughs> quiz. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that puts you in the lead, Alex. So you're in pole position to seize that trophy. I'm Grasp taking that trophy awesome from Martin's good. hands. Eventually, yeah. if anyone yeah. who watches on cold, YouTube might see, might see the trophy at some point on the podcast. I'm. Co- yeah, I reckon yeah, you've yeah, lost it, Martin. Out. I think you've lost it, and you've been trying to cover it this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> you traded it for some quavers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm eighty percent sure it's in my cupboard. Eighty <laughs> percent. Close wins. How sure is Martin? <laughs> Would you like the bonus question? Yeah. Okay. Go for it's it. It's actually the answer to this is a percentage, coincidentally. Uh, hmm. Closest wins. What percentage of the human body weight does the brain take up? Human body weight. Hmm. What percentage of the human body weight is the brain? Aha! Yes, Martin. It's exactly 6%. Okay, that's your guess. That sounds, that sounds a bit high, actually. <laughs> the brain take up. It's quite, head's quite heavy, though. So. Yeah, head is quite heavy. Yeah. Head is heavy. Mm. Yes, Alex. Four percent. Ooh, Alex is closer. It is two point three percent. There we go. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. I was thinking, like, is this going to be a trick? Is it going to be like twenty percent? <laughs> there's lots of heavy. There's lots of heavy bones in the body, I guess, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think of... interestingly, if I remember correctly, it was the average of in a woman, the brain on average, occupies 2.31% of their body weight. In men, it's mm. 2.28%. Um, so it's actually, so it averages out quite nicely, 2.3%. Oh, okay. um, uh, that's probably because of increased muscle mass on your typical male. <laughs> that's what uh, we tell ourselves. That's what we tell ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you for that, gentlemen. Thank you for that quiz. And thank you for that really interesting podcast. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot about deities, particularly on that island. I'm going to go there on holiday. Once we're allowed to travel, become a god. Go on holiday and finally be loved by everyone. Worship me! <laughs> finally. Finally. Um, finally. finally. Oh, dear. What are you all uh, watching and listening to us? Please give us a tweet at JInterestingYT or comment below on the YouTube video if you're watching us on YouTube uh, with your thoughts and with any stories of other deities that you're aware of. As in people worshipped as deities. Or do you worship someone as a god? Let us know who it is and why. And, and why uh, is it Nicolas Cage? <laughs> why is it Nicolas Cage? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>